Hello, and welcome to another edition of Because Science Live. I know I've started off this stream pretty professionally, but it's all live. This is all happening in real time. Everything that I'm saying is off the top of my head. And hopefully it'll go well, because I'm here, like I am, on Fridays, starting off on the new channels, to take your comments, your questions, your reactions to things, and try to explain them in the same way that I do on the channel, but in a new way. Because, hey, let's... Let's do this. This is all we have. Let's do it. So, uh, I have my producer Aaron here with me. Hey, Sam. <laughs> yes, that's what, the kid, that's what the kids say. What kind of questions we got? Uh, Genesee Edwards asks, if a lightsaber is essentially plasma, wouldn't you need a welding mask to look at it, much like a welder works? Hmm. Well, if, lightsaber, if a lightsaber is plasma, I don't think you would need any protection to look at it because plasma acts as a perfect black body radiation source. So the sun looks like the sun because it is a certain temperature. It is emitting a certain amount of heat energy and radiation which gives it this wavelength of light. Yellow, orange-ish. It looks like this. Black body radiation. Just kind of if it was perfectly radiating heat into space. Which it is. Which keeps us alive. Which is good. Now a lightsaber because it is emitting the same kind of heat signature as something like the sun, it is a black body emitter. So you can see uh, the heat coming off of it, and the, and I guess that would mean that it's not that much hotter than a few thousand degrees. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense based on what we see. So, yes, if a lightsaber was hot enough to, say, cut through a blast door like butter, like, <laughs> this is unintentional, like Qui-Gon Jinn. Nice. Yeah. Nailed it. Like Qui-Gon Jinn, then it might be emitting, it might be so bright that you can't look at it. But right now, it doesn't look like it's that hot because it's not that bright. What, what else we, I didn't, I honestly didn't mean to Qui-Gon it. But well, you did. That's fine. I, I, here we are. Uh, Jan Hubasek says, Why can you hold Tesseract or Scepter but not Infinity Stones? Why can't you hold Infinity Stones? Well, my theory, if you go back to a previous episode of Because Science, was that there is something akin to a black hole on the inside of an Infinity Stone. And if that were the case, if you were to touch it or break it apart and interact with its event horizon, it would start pulling atoms of your body at differential uh, gravity. So the, the part that is closest to the Infinity Stone would be pulled the most, and then it would be less and less as you got further and further away, because that's how gravity works. So you'd be spaghettified through, <laughs> through the stone, and you'd be, you'd be, you don't want that. Or it could just be comic books. <laughs> Wait, what am I doing? It's this show. Let's keep going. Uh, how could Ivy's poison affect someone with enhanced healing like Wolverine? Right. So, my last episode of Because Science was about poison Ivy and what kind of toxin she would need on her lips, on her lips to uh, kiss someone and take them out. How would that interact with someone like Wolverine? <sighs> That's hard. And uh, I kind of got into this in my Iocane powder episode. Can you become immune to a certain kind of you know, poison with some kind of chemical structure like this, which looks more like a stop sign. Not accurate, but it's kind of like a benzene ring, which will give you cancer. Anyway, Wolverine has a healing factor. So at the very basic level, he is replacing cells that are damaged or destroyed. Um, and he might have an, uh, a hyperactive autoimmune, uh, autoimmune, nope immune system. So if he has all of that, toxic materials are still going to be toxic to him because there aren't the same kind of immune responses to something that is toxic as there is to something like a virus or a disease. It is much harder to deal with and when we have antidotes for poisons and venoms and toxins, it's usually another chemical that takes that chemical out of your body. And so I don't know if Wolverine would be immune to every poison, every toxin. In fact, we know he's not. That's how he died in Logan, kind of. Materials leaching from his adamantium into his body and he was becoming toxic. And then he died. And this can happen with pretty much 
anything. That's why we have to be very, very careful about what we put in our bodies because different materials accumulate in our bodies in different ways. Logan had adamantium across his whole skeleton, but not his teeth. You ask me about that all the time. They just didn't put it there. It was intentional. Uh, he, has, he has metal all over his bones, and that is getting into his bloodstream, and it accumul it's, it's maybe bioaccumulating in his body. There are certain kinds of vitamins, like vitamin A and vitamin K, that also accumulate in your body and do not get excreted out in the urine, and they can become toxic. So you have to be very aware of how all of this chemistry is making its way through your body. I, I think I answered that. What's next? A uh, regular drop bear says, question, do pilots have to take into consideration the curvature of the earth when flying long distances? Uh, I'm not a pilot. So I would imagine that if you're high enough, the curvature of the earth is more or less, you're just changing elevation a little bit to deal with it. So if you were on, mm, let's, let's go with this. If you were flying above, the surface of the earth. This is not to scale. Just so you know, this is not a full-sized earth. If you're flying above the surface of the earth like this and you are in your little plane like this. Now you all know my secret that I'm very good at drawing. Flying over the plane, the elevation distance as you, the elevation change as you went along is going to be something like this as you moved across the surface of the earth. Now this is highly exaggerated here, the dimensions here. So pilots would have to accommodate for this change in elevation as they move. But again, it's not like you're falling off of the face of the earth, so the, gra so the change is gradual, and so it's not going to be anything that you really have to worry about unless your flight mechanics uh, go haywire, or uh, you're going very, 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 very fast, which none of our planes do, you know, close to the speed of light, or if the Earth was flat. But it's definitely not. I mean, if it were, why would it, I draw it like this? Checkmate. <laughs> what else What else we got? Joshua S. asks, if Marty McFly's hoverboard was possible today, why would it not work on water? Good question. How do hoverboards work? I only see two ways. One of them, and they both, you can look up videos on YouTube. You can see this both, uh, both of these mechanisms in action. The first is what's called um, quantum locking. So you can have a superconducting material like, uh, it's, I forget the name, it's some, it's some uh, sapphire compound, and you can make a wafer out of it. And if you super cool, that wafer down, down to superconducting temperatures, way, 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 way down, close to absolute zero, or closer to it, then it expels all of the magnetic fields from it. So uh, you have something like the wafer here, and the magnetic fields, instead of piercing through it in a form of magnetic flux, flux capacitor, wow! See how I brought that back? Yeah. You proud of me? It's like it's your job. Anyway, usually there's some kind of magnetic flux capacitor through materials. That's how we measure it. But for a superconducting wafer like this, it expels all of the magnetic fields from its body. And when it does that, it is essentially, because these are forces, if it tried to move, it would apply forces because of Lenz's law and other things you can look up. This stays essentially locked in space. And you can look up videos, but it's really amazing. When you have it above magnets and it's superconducting, you can move this wafer any way you want and it will just stay in space in that orientation. Now that is one way to have a hoverboard. You could have, uh, these are gonna come with caveats, but for one version, you need a bed of magnets and then superconducting hoverboard and you can be above it. The other way is to have a conductive surface like co uh, copper, yeah, <laughs> I was gonna combine copper and tin, uh, copper, and then above it, you create this magnetic flux, which will create uh, fields that actually repel each other in an equal and opposite way. 
And so when you do that, you could say put spinning magnets at the bottom of a board and put that board above a conductive surface and it will repel itself by changing the, magnetic, the magnetic fields in this way and then it will levitate. If you look up the Hendo, H-E-N-D-O, Hendo hoverboard, um, I actually wrote it and it actually floats and it's a hoverboard. Sounds like a dying cat and has about seven minutes of battery life, but it is indeed a hoverboard. Now, all of that is to say that why doesn't Marty's McFly, why doesn't Marty McFly's hoverboard work over water? Well, it is because this form of hovering needs some other material to work. In the case of the Hendo hoverboard, it is a conductive surface, a metal surface, or in the case of quantum locking, it is a bed of magnets. Water, of wi uh, water is neither. That is why, if he is using similar methods to this. Whew, what's the next question? Uh, T-Voice asks, what is the difference between biological toxins and chemical toxins? Do they affect humans any differently? Bi biological and what? Chemical. Well, I would argue that all of biology is just really clever chemistry that the Earth came up with. So it's, it's hard. Maybe, maybe the distinction you're making is between organic uh, toxins and chemicals and something that are, you know, just like mercury poisoning, which is just metal. Well, again, these toxins, depending on what they are made of, what their structure is, what, are, what they are bonded to, they will move through your body in very different ways. So to give you an example, um, salt, regular old table salt, it has the chemical, stru not structure, but chemical composition of sodium chloride. Now together, you can eat table salt just fine. In fact, we need salt to live. But if you were to separate this into just sodium, which is a metal, and just chlorine, either of those two ingested will kill you. Sodium explodes in water, and chlorine is a hyper poisonous gas, so poisonous that it has been weaponized. So, it is very important how materials, how molecules and atoms and elements are bonded together, and that determines what it does to your body. So yes, there would be a difference between organic uh, toxins and non-organic toxins, but it's gonna depend on a case-by-case -case basis. Whew. Nailed it. Thank uh, you. JM Pickering, would, could a Jedi be killed I that name. by a sniper firing a solid projectile from a range beyond their ability to perceive incoming threats? Uh, hmm. Okay, so if a Jedi cannot perceive an incoming projectile, can he or she or it block it? I think, uh, no, I don't, I, I think what you're getting at is could they use the, the force to kind of uh, anticipate the shot and, uh, and deal with it. Urgh, that's only if the force exists. It's very hard to say. Um, human reaction time is just around 250 milliseconds. So it is not a very long amount of time at all. And because bullets are so fast, many hundreds or even thousands of meters per second, if you are talking about high-powered rifles or tank shells or whatever. Because of that, when you divide the speed, wait, when you <laughs> divide this time by the speed of the incoming projectile, you get a very, very small amount of time. Time that is usually shorter than this. So, <laughs> A, a gun would have to be very, very, very far away for you to get out of the way or, or block it or dodge it because you need this much time at the very, very least. Uh, if it is any closer than that, you're not even gonna see it coming. But if it's so far away that you can't see it, can't hear it, it's not gonna matter, even if you're a Jedi, I guess. But if they block the bullet, the bullet would turn into a spatter of metal, as we calculated in a previous episode, and is in a comic. Validation. What we got next? Cayman1329 asks, how would a plant have to evolve to become something like Swamp Thing? Whoa. Okay. Uh, before I answer that, 
Hey, if you're just joining us, this is another uh, edition of Because Science Live, where I am taking your comments and questions and corrections and trying to answer them in our regular old format, but all off the top of this dome, uh, because I want to have a more direct interaction with you all and see where the super nerds are among you. So, the previous user, whose name is... Uh, Cayman1329. Cayman1329 asks, how could you get a swap thing via evolution? I have no idea, but evolution is very crafty. We have, we've seen animals that have become almost hybridized with plants, which I think is kind of what you're getting at. There is a salamander, for example, that has evolved to contain photosynthetic organisms in its skin, and we think it may even get some kind of nutrition from this. So it is symbiotic and is a synthesis of plant and animal both working together via evolution to be a better organism or a more successful organism. A swamp thing. Salamanders live in swamps. So I'm pretty sure I answered your question completely. <laughs> what else we got? Again, this question a lot. How close to the sun can someone go? How close to the sun can someone go? Complicated question. Because... If you left Earth's atmosphere, that's about as far as you can go, period. Uh, so it, d it depends, with, with, with or without protection. Um, without protection, being in the, being, uh, the difference between being in shadow, if you're on a spacewalk, the difference between being in shadow and being illuminated by the sun is hundreds of degrees. So, Unprotected, the closest you can get to the sun is space. <laughs> Immediately outside of Earth, and that's it. You won't be able to take it. Uh, protected, I don't know. That's a NASA question. What else we got? Why do pickles have bumps? Why do pickles have bumps? I, I do not know. I, I have no idea. Um, I could venture a guess and say that it's something that happens during the pickling process where the cell walls uh, of the plant expand in the salt-rich solution to take in more water and thus kind of bulge the outer surface of the pickle slash cucumber and then it would look more bumpy? But again, I'm just using basic physics and assumptions and chemistry to come up with that. I could be completely wrong. I'd have to look it up, but I can't because we're doing this live. We'll do it live. What else we got? Can you get energy from eating your hair? <laughs> okay. Me? Can I, I? I think. I think you specifically. Can I do it? I mean, it's you. It could be you general. There's not a whole lot of nutritional value in your hair, I would imagine, because it is dead. It is just protein. I like to think of hair as kind of just play doing itself out from your pores. Just, just kind of just kind of like, like that, but protein Play-Doh. Uh, and that's gross. I would also venture the guess that there's not a lot of nutrition in hair because when you die, your hair kind of stays around. And what's eaten first is your flesh and your body. But consume, you're, you're reconsumed by the earth and its various organisms that are evolved to do so, and your energy is returned from whence it came. It's actually kind of beautiful. But do you know what stays behind? Hair, and fingernails, and teeth, and bones, because there isn't a lot of energy, nutrition, to get from them. So, based on that fact, I would, I would guess that because your hair stays around after you die, and it's not consumed and degraded, that there's probably not a whole lot in there that it could do for you if you ate it. And, and, yeah, cats spit up their hairballs. They don't eat that. <laughs> I have a lot of cats, I know. What else we got? Would there I don't be, know why I'm shimmying in between each answer, but it feels right. Would there be a slight delay in Ray and Kylo's force telepathy thing? Whoa, that's a great question. Oh, no. This is, this is the kind of question where I would need to start looking up some stuff. Um, so the, 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 the Ray Kylo Ren 
telepathy question gets at a larger question of how do you how do you communicate across vast distances in space because you are limited to how fast information can travel which as far as we know is the speed of light so if ray and kylo ren were say a light year away which they could be in a galaxy far far away who knows with hyperdrives and all that stuff then it would take if i a light speed telepathy thought to uh my love interest brother who love knows interest. love interest love interest Raylo. it's pretty wide though we should do the dimensions of Adam Driver in the next episode. Anyway, so, if they were a light year apart and I, da -da -da -da, light speed telepathy, it would take a year to get to Ray. It's too long. So, what other ways can we do something like that? Well, a lot of sci-fi authors will um, invoke quantum entanglement, which is the property of, say I have one particle that has spin up and another particle that has spin down. But until I look at one of these, they are both in both positions. Quantum mechanics is weird. Then if, I, if these are entangled in a quantum pair, then no matter how far I take away this one particle, once I know its position, the other particle's position immediately flips to the other one. If this one is up and I throw it 10 million light years away, and I observe it, the other one is down, or whatever the opposite of what I just said was. So could this be a way to communicate? Again, not as far as we know. There are theorems in quantum mechanics, uh, I think specifically the no non-communication theorem, or no communication theorem, which states that you still need more information than this to transmit information at this spooky action at a distance speed. So, the speed of Ray and Kylo Ren's telepathy right now would have to be something, if they are very far apart, mystical. I know, it's not satisfying to me either. Because of the Force. Because of the Force, and because Ryan Johnson wanted to do stuff. Uh, I, I think, hey, in the chat, let me know. I've been thinking about it. There are a lot of unanswered questions like physics wise and stuff about The Last Jedi. Would you watch an episode if I went back and covered why those bomb drops that way, how Leia could do that thing, and all that is kind of like a roundup? Because I'll do it. I'll do it if you watch it. And subscribe. What else we got? How could the Death Star affect the gravity balance of a solar system? Hmm. Well, if the Death Star is the size of a small moon. That's no moon. Yeah, I guess they never say it's a, well, I mean, it's big enough it's to be spacey. confused for a moon. But it's no moon. I know, thank you. Uh, <laughs> if it's big enough to be confused for a moon, even though it's no moon, then it definitely has enough mass to uh, affect the gravity of objects locally. It's not gonna change the entire orbit of a solar system unless it smacks into another planet and changes its orbit and that planet hits another planet. Something catastrophic would have to happen to radically change even our own solar system's orbits. However, if let's say, let's say that uh, you have a planet here and then the Death Star comes in uh, and, oh, oh, and this planet has an orbit that looks like this around something like a star. Now if the, now if the whoop, Death Star came in here into the orbit around this planet, I know this is getting complicated, I know, stick with me. Then, as you can just see from from this little diagram here, where the center of mass, where all of the mass in this system on average is, has now shifted a little bit, which will shift the total orbit around the home star. So, yes, but not a lot, to answer your question. <laughs> Running out of room, all right. We got time for a couple uh, more, couple so more. keep them coming. 
Have you ever looked at non-thermal cold plasma when looking at construction for lightsabers? A lot of Star Wars questions today. A lot of Star Wars questions today. Uh, cold plasma. You say... You read cold plasma, but cold plasma is still pretty hot. Um, and uh, let's just gotta, let's just gotta get this out of the way. When you're talking about lightsabers, you have to pick one of two modes. And this is why everyone got mad at me about uh, the Darth Vader versus Xenomorphs episode. Either lightsabers are cold, cold plasma enough that you can, going back to your very first question, cold enough that you can look at them and they don't burn your hands off. And, you know, like, and it's cool. Or they are hot enough to, like in The Last Jedi, cut through a rock like it isn't there, get through a blast door like it isn't there, like in the Phantom Menace, again, Qui-Gon. If it can do that, then it is also gonna set the entire room on fire and burn your hands off. You kinda gotta pick one or the other. I vary between the two because I'm not trying to come up with, <laughs> with the ultimate, all-encompassing theory of lightsaber. I am merely trying to introduce interesting sciencey stuff. So, cold plasma, yeah, sure, but it, it depends on your interpretation of what a lightsaber is. Cool, Probably so I think one. we can do one more question on Because Science Live, ooh. Can Black Panther's suit absorb P and S waves from earthquakes? Mm. So in, in, uh, oh, you mean, <laughs> you mean waves like this going through the earth, yeah. So, uh, earthquakes shift the mass of the earth around. And when that happens, mass presses against other mass and that causes a compression that causes a wave of compression, kind of like cars piling up on the highway or, or you know, a, a car at the start of a long line of cars taps a brake and then there's a wave. It's kind of like that, but with molecules hitting each other. That has a lot of kinetic energy behind it. Um, a 9.0 earthquake has a, a lot of kinetic energy behind it. However, I looked into this as a back of the envelope calculation. It's not in, in so immense that it could, as uh, Black Panther comics say, power an entire nation. So if Wakanda had the same power output as a, another similarly sized African nation, then even all of the all of the earthquakes in Africa, their kinetic energy over one year still isn't even a good percentage of the amount of energy that they would need. But that's only because that Africa isn't very close to earthquake prone areas and Wakanda could be more advanced than that. So there's some wiggle room. Um, it could absorb kinetic energy, but you would need a lot of it, even if it's from earthquakes. Okay, and that's all the time we have for today. I Hope that you enjoyed this episode of Because Science Live. It's all happening right here, all from here. Uh, if you have more comments and questions, you can go back and watch the stream of this again and input, and I will look for next week's vlog, next week's episode of Because Science, which we have told you about. We have. Mm -mm. No, we haven't. Mm -mm. No, nope. oh, nope, we have not. Gotta watch the next vlog for that, coming out on Tuesday morning. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and hey, be nice to each other because this is this is all we got. Bye.